the issue of the question why the ore is where it is. So what regularities are behind the ore formation process? Uh, here we discuss hydrothermal ore formation uh, related to uh, metasomatites. Metasomatites means rocks that have been altered from their original rocks. For instance, the scorn is a metasomatic rock, or grayson is a metasomatic rock. Grayson, the original rock, is the granite or another acid rock, um, and the scorn is a uh, silicate rock uh, origin, originated from limestone or marble. So we are back here to our exploration model of the Erzgebirge. We have the big amount of different types of tin mineralizations, as already discussed, tin uh, grasins in pressure pipes, tin related to grasins in, uh, for, uh, bound to the end contact of granites, grasins in top positions of a granite cupola, like here on Friedersdorf, or the famous Zinoviets deposits, veins and scones, scones in limes or limestones or marbles. Um, so here uh, we are now discussing a grayson here in these rheolitic rocks. So it looks like this. Uh, so this is 10 centimeters, so it's all together about maybe 35 centimeters width. width. We have here the host rock, a real light. We have here a quartz vein, what is not really a vein because it doesn't have sharp contacts, but this cloudy, uh, cloudy contacts to the surrounding grayson. Um, so we have here a, a mica quartz grayson and a quartz mica grayson. So the amount of quartz, uh, the ratio of quartz and mica differs from here to here. So the quartz amount uh, increases from here to here. In the central zone, it's almost quartz. But with visible cassiterite grains up to three, four, five millimeters with calcoborite with fluoride. Uh, the tin grade here in the center reaches five, ten percent. In the quartz maker grayson, we have a tin grade one, two, three, four thousand ppm. In the micro grayson, we have some hundreds up to a thousand ppm. And in zero light, we do not have tin at all, maybe 10, 15 ppm. So we have a very, very strong zoning, a mineral zoning around this vein let here in a very, very narrow space. And we have a mineral zoning, and the mineral zoning controls the ore grades. And we have very, very sharp rims uh, between these mineral zones. So these rims are a few millimeters thick only. And in this rim, uh, uh, the minerals are overprinted or transforming, reacting from this to this. For instance, uh, uh, potassium feldspar is transferred into mica, muscovite, light mica, here within this rim. And here quartz replaces the mica and all other minerals. Um, another important property is that the vertical extension is huge compared to the lateral extension of these veins. Now, if we formalize it somehow, we have here an acid rock, a granite. We have uh, or granitic of granitic composition. 
we have here a quartz core, which is, if it is becomes bigger, it is barren. There is nothing, no ore in it. Only if the zone is like this narrow, we may have uh, bigger crystals of cassiterite or other ores in it. Then we have a quartz grayson, we have a topaz grayson, we have a mica grayson, and we have the granite. In some cases we have here a surrounding hematite uh, zone as well. These grayson's are always zoned, and they are obviously the result of the interaction uh, between the rock and the solution. The, the solution carrying the ore minerals to this place. Now the question is where is the ore, the cathodite is here and, and not, not here, for instance, because this solution seeping through the post rock carries it and loses it here somewhere in these zones and does not carry it further. Um, so here's another example of a metasomatite. We have here a, a gneiss in the scone deposit of hemoline, penetrated by this uh, very, very nice scone, amphibole pyroxene scone, completely replaced with massive cassiterite and quartz. So this is around oh, 30, 40 centimeters. Uh, and this is maybe half, one and a half, two meters long. So is the initial uh, granitic composition of this gneiss is completely replaced by the amphiboles, the magnetite, the cassiterite, and the quartz. Uh, the grades are exceptional high, the tin grades. But the tin is related not only to cassiterite, but also to uh, uh, tin in garnets and pyroxanes, partly. Though not everything is mineable of this tin. We have a comparable high background of tin uh, bound to the silicates that cannot be recovered. So this here sometimes has further cracks or extensions like this, and this is one of these narrow uh, scorn veins. We have zero signals. We have an aureole of hematite. We have a magnetite. Uh, area or rim, and we have the center composed of quartz, uh, calcite, and ore minerals with a high uh, tin grade. And in this hematite area or uh, rim, we have a tin grade of just a, so a few hundred ppm, and in the glaze, we have almost nothing 30 ppm tin, and much less, of course. Now, again, the tin is here. It's less less here, and here's nothing. So why it is here where it is? Going further down to this to to, to investigate this little vein here, we can have a thin section. We investigate the mineral mineralogical composition. So the central vein is composed of quartz. Chloride, calcite, with some epitoid, fluoride, of course, chalcopyrite, the tin garnet, cassiterite, hematite, and mica. Here we have mainly the magnetite, hematite. This is this uh, reddish rim. This is gneiss with hematite. And here's the normal gneiss uh, composed of albite, autoclaus, muscovite, and quartz. Um, if you have a look closer at this central vein, we can see here uh, rock, rock pieces that are completely altered. But they show us that this uh, movement channel of the solution was uh, uh, created by a tectonic event, creating this little fracture here. So the solution, the solution comes in, 
flows mainly through the channel and then it penetrates into the wall rock, alterates the wall rock, releases the typical uh, mineral zoning and releases also the raw minerals. So the hydrothermal, hydrothermal solution carries here in this case fluorine fixed as fluoride, silica fixed as quartz, and then tin, indium, cadmium, zinc, copper, iron, of course, and lithium. Um, so this little diagram shows us or chart the central. Here's the quartz and the cassiterite, the magnetite rim, the hematite rim, and the gneiss uh, element that are enriched, like for instance here uh, tungsten. Uh, <clears throat> or tin and other elements have their maximum here in this magnetite zone like this here. But it's a very, very strong zoning. So iron, zinc and cesium concentrate in the magnetite zone, for instance, and other elements are depleted, means dissolved and moved away by the hydrothermal solution seeping from here through the rocks. And once the solution has reached the gneiss, it is in equilibrium with the gneiss and cannot uh, create any more uh, chemical reactions. So <clears throat> this is a bigger picture. We have these uh, veins, narrow veins. We have here the big uh, magnetite and amphibole uh, bodies and from them, the, uh, uh, these cracks are stretching and the, uh, uh, the scorn is replacing this, uh, this uh, uh, gneiss. Uh, <clears throat> so everything is in a very, very small uh, space. And because of this, the system must be isothermal. There's no real temperature gradient between here and here within this half meter uh, between the bigger uh, uh, bigger uh, scone, scones around it and this remaining boulder. So it is of course a chemical process uh, uh, creating these uh, zonations. Uh, so back to the uh, here we have a typical grayson. This grid here is created by uh, cracks in the rocks. This is a granitic rock. Uh, so the hydrothermal solution infiltrated into the cracks, and from the cracks, it is seeping into the host rock and creating these uh, grayson uh, rims. Um, so this creation process is bound to granite, granitic systems. Typical minerals of the creations are cassiterite, chalcoride, wolframite, silverite, topaz, and uh, light mica. And usually there is much fluorine in the system, forming minerals like topaz and uh, fluorine bearing mica. Um, so how it looks like in nature, we can see here, this is the Eastern Erzgebirge, a huge stockwork, cupola structure, collapsed, collapsed already hundreds of years ago, hundreds of years ago, uh, and mined, uh, mined till the year 1991. And those are the tailing points here related to this uh, big mine. Those are the biggest non-uranium tailings in the ore mountains. A section below this <coughs> collapse looks like this. We have here a cupola of the uh, granite intrusion and the related stock work. Another example, uh, a uh, vein like uh, Grayson body uh, in the big Eibenstock granite, completely mined out, uh, vertical extension up to 50 meters thickness. 
10, 20, 30, 10, 10, 20 meters. And this is an example of a topaz crescent rock, a boulder as we can find it during uh, geological mapping in the forests. So we have here a light yellowish, brownish, grayish rock with no sulfides anymore. All sulfides are oxidized. And this light mineral here is the topaz between the big quartz crystals and the black stuff is the cassiterite. If you don't know, you don't consider this as topaz, of course. And in the center of the rocks, we still can uh, find the topa as uh, the sulfides. And this is the oxidation ring. So if we crush these boulders in the center, we have the original composition with calcobrite, with smooth minerals, uh, even uh, sometimes lead, uh, zinc minerals, antimony minerals, and the cassiterite. So, but now what kind of chemistry is behind it? So we have the granite, the main component here are quartz, mica, and uh, the potassium feldspar or uh, sodium feldspar. So, and the reaction rim between the granite and the mica grazen, this uh, potassium feldspar is uh, completely transferred into light mica, uh, muscovite or sericide. So quartz is getting free. So it's, quartz is formed, potassium is released to the solution and moved away. So this process releases the mica and the quartz from the original potassium feldspar. Then the next stone is the, the next reaction is between the mica crescent and the topaz crescent, where the mica <coughs> is dissolved uh, by the solution and transformed into topaz, again releasing quartz as hot material and releasing uh, potassium. And finally, in the center of the uh, crescent, uh, the topaz is transferred into quartz, uh, releasing fluorine and quartz as uh, crystals or as hard material. So then while reacting, the solution is neutralizing. Uh, so, as we have discussed already, the reaction mica topaz consumes fluorine, the reaction topaz quartz releases fluorine. Tin in these solutions is transported mainly as tin fluorine complexes. So, the solubility of tin decreases with increasing pH, and the solubility of tin also decreases with decreasing fluorine. And this chemistry helps us to understand the background uh, of the location of the cassiterite in these grazing rocks. So we have here uh, a chart showing us the stability fields of the main minerals of quartz, uh, uh, topaz, um, potassium feldspar, uh, mica, and the quartz core. Uh, depending on the fluorine concentration of the solution and the pH of the solution. At 300 uh, decreases. So, means if, if an acid uh, fluorine bearing solution meets the granite, it is in not equilibrium with the granite or with the granitic rock. And so the uh, solution reacts with the granite forming step by step uh, these minerals. Means the solution chemistry changes from the acid ones to, to a type of solution being in equilibrium with the granite. And the rock uh, chemistry changes from the original granitic composition 
up to a composition that is in equilibrium with the initial solution, means acidic with uh, fluorine. So we have now uh, this uh, idealized image showing uh, the Grayson body, the movement of the solution along this fissure and how it penetrates or seeps through the wall rock, forming these uh, zones or the reaction rims and the mineral zones of the Grayson uh, uh, body around the fissure. Um, so we have here uh, the reaction rim granite micrograyson where the feldspores are transferred, transformed into mica. Here we have the reaction rim where the mica is transformed into the topaz. And here in this rim, everything is dissolved and only the quartz remains. Um, depending on the concrete fluorine concentration and pH uh, and the temperature, of course, these fields of stability are changing. So this is just an example. Um, if we have fl higher fluorine concentration, the uh, feldspar is directly replaced by topaz, for instance. What we can see in several dikes with topaz directly replacing uh, the potassium feldspar. So, uh, okay. Now back to our uh, nice picture with the tin mineralization. So we find the tin mainly in the fissure, if the fissure is small. If the, here we have a bigger quartz body, uh, it may reach tens of meters, then it's completely barren. Um, so the tin is mainly here, in the quartz, uh, in the topaz grayson, and a little bit in the in the micro grayson. So we have here these uh, reaction rims between the zones, the granite, the micro zone, topaz zone, quartz core, etc. And here, where the granite is, or the the feldspar is replaced by the mica, the mica is replaced by topaz, topaz is replaced by quartz. With the changing fluorine concentration in the solution and of course the decreasing pH we have here, or increasing, sorry, we have here, here a low pH of one or two, a very acid solution, and then it decreases step by step. So the chemistry is the chemical composition of the solution comes into equilibrium with the original granitic rock step by step. And here in these reaction rooms, the chemical composition of the solution has a very steep gradient. So it loses fluorine. Here a little bit because fluorine is also fixed in the mica. Uh, but much fluorine is consumed here, here when the topaz is formed. So, and the loss of fluorine uh, results in the settlement of the cosylride, because the cosylride is transported as uh, fluorine complexes in this acid high temperature solution. So, it is settled mainly here and uh, here as well in this quartz core. But if the quartz core is getting bigger, it is getting dissolved again, the cosylride, and moved further to the topaz and the mica zone. So we have this uh, barren quartz core. So now I take you to a completely different environment where I was working many years ago in the 80s, Southern Arabia, Arabian Peninsula, Yemen, a huge platform cover, 
some outcrops of basement rocks, the old uh, Mozambique belt rocks, Pan-African rocks, uh, here are kind of upper Proterozoic mafic volcanics, but thousands and thousands of square kilometers of seem to be barren limestones and sandstones. So this platform sediments look like this. This is Jurassic limestones, some houses of the local Yemeni people living here. Or this one, a typical Yemeni town uh, surrounded by this huge platform sediments, 1,000 meters of Cretaceous sandstones overlain by Paleocene limestones and followed by uh, Eocene and younger uh, gypsum and shales, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and within these sequences, just by an accident, uh, some samples for characterization of these rocks indicated high sink values. Um, so we just by uh, initially we thought about wrong analytics because those rocks did not show any any kind of mineralization. They were just grayish, whitish, etc. But later we understood that it's uh, oxidization oxy, oxidization process results of former sulfide. Uh, rocks, sulfide uh, ores, zinc sulfides. So this is the sequence of the platform sediments. So we have here the basement, we have Jurassic and unconformity, the, uh, the sandstones, uh, the tertiary rocks, Paleocene, Eocene, unconformities, um, caused by rifting processes. Rifting processes, as we you know, the Gulf of Aden, the rift is coming from Africa through the Gulf of Aden, and we have here these big folds uh, uh, stretching into the Gulf of Aden, and the Arabian Peninsula is moving to the northeast, uh, creating here uh, opening structures, graben problem structures here. You know, we indicated this by these uh, schemes here. Uh, this is an old air image from the 80s. And even on this air, air, airborne image, we can see here these rounded formations. This is a kind of a, a cast sinkholes, but the dark color is caused by iron by iron and uh, dolomite, anchorite. And here we have these dark colors as well, showing us faults stretching over, over tens or hundreds of kilometers, cutting these platform rocks. Um, so now if we get down to the valley here, we can see this. We can here uh, see a fault structure, the Paleocene rocks, Eocene shales, and here this strong uh, iron, hematite, limonite, and also uh, mineralization, aragonite, barite, oxidized iron, gossan. So it looks like this, thicknesses, Three, four, five, ten meters, strong fractures, and uh, this is a cross section through these rocks. We have here uh, five, six, seven hundred meters difference in elevation between the valley and the top of these flat mountains. Now <clears throat> we started to understand. And this is something very interesting, and to try to understand what is the, the sense of it. 
So we sampled the base of these uh, Eocene, uh, Paleocene limestones and found a strong dolomitization process along these faults uh, being related to the base of the Paleocene limestones, but also to the top of the limestones uh, below these shales. So we have your dolomite instead of calcite. We have uh, sometimes some sulfites, plagioclases as well, and uh, more quartz. If we have a look at the uh, mineralogy, we can see here the original sedimentary limestone with the foraminifera, and here completely recrystallized dolomitic rock with much iron uh, uh, between the uh, crystals. The geochemistry shows us the increase, for instance, of mangan amber manganese closer to the, to the fold, the increase of zinc, uh, the increase of uh, silica, uh, loss of calcium, increase of magnesium. Uh, barium related to little faults, barite, depending what you sample. Now, if you bring it to the bigger picture, to the uh, sequence of the uh, uh, sediments, we can see these alteration zones already in Jurassic limestones in the sandstones, Cretaceous sandstones, we don't see anything. They are completely barren and no, no alteration, just some iron here and there, but as it, it is usual in the sandstones, but then again, a strong dolomitization with zinc and limonitic mineralization uh, along these faults. So, of course, somehow we need to understand, try to understand why it is like it is, why we do not see anything here in these sandstones, and why is the mineralization that is related to this limestone. Uh, so we have this chart of uh, stability of calcite, dolomite, magnesite, and quartz, depending on the magnesium concentration in the solution and the pH of the solution. So we have again a typical metasomatic uh, zoning of limestone, consisting of limestone, dolomite, and quartz. And depending on the concentration of magnesium, we may add magnesite uh, to the sequence if the concentration of magnesium uh, would be very high. So the initial solution again must be acid. It is uh, stable with uh, quartz and it probably carries then the, uh, the, the zinc and other uh, uh, metals. In these charts, we can see the dependency of the solubility of uh, zinc sulfide uh, from the temperature. We have here a temperature 100 to 200 degrees. We have a stable uh, sulfur uh, activity of 10 minus 4 a chlorine activity of one. Though we can see how steep is the gradient here of the solubility. Uh, so from 10 minus eight, it increases up to 10 to minus four, having a pH at a pH of five, which is very strong. And uh, so, and if it is, uh, if the chlorine activity is less, here we have one, and here zero, zero, one, this dependency is much less because the zinc is transported in chloride uh, complexes. So the chlorine has a very, very strong influence on the solubility of the zinc minerals. Here we have the stability fields of sphalerite and woodside. It's also a zinc uh, uh, sulfide, depending on the chlorine activity uh, at 150 degrees. 
Now, the pH, we can see the minimum of the solubility is minus my, uh, at pH is 7, 8. Uh, and we can see how sharp the solubility decreases while the pH increases. So it means if an acid solution carrying sphalerite meets the limestone, it is getting neutralized. It is uh, transforming the limestone into uh, dolomite and losing the sphalerite. So the sphalerite is forming then in these reaction rims again. So we have this uh, uh, exploration model, we have the fissure zone, the fault, we have the sandstone where the solution is in equilibrium with the sandstone, nothing happens. And once it meets the limestone, the reaction starts. So we have uh, the different zones of the of the metasomatite body, the reaction rims, and where the uh, zinc minerals are settling. So reconstructing then the geological history of what we see today, we can have here a uniform plate of limestone before the rifting process started. And then the rifting process start, starts where the faults forming, we have the solutions coming, we have the replacements, the formation of the metasomatite bodies, because it starts to move earlier, of course, and then we have this strong replacement showing us only this piece of the metasomatite, this piece of the metasomatite, the vein itself, and the big hidden piece of metasite, metasomatite must be here below the young uh, sediments. So now if we try somehow to analyze whether the process is able to form a, a deposit, we can do very simple uh, mass balance calculations uh, seeing that if a solution carries only 10 milligram of zinc per liter, what is not much, uh, then we are able to form a zinc sulfide body of 75,000 tons uh, related to a metasomatite body of 100 by 200 by 2,000 meters. But we are speaking here about metasomatite stretching decades of kilometers. Uh, <clears throat> so this is a bigger picture we have here. The, the full zone, uh, the uh, spreading zone coming from Africa, the transform faults, and here is these big faults in the Arabic insula here as well, uh, following the direction of the spreading zone here. Uh, so this is probably the uh, exploration model how these things have been formed. So we have a huge heat dome uh, on top of this uh, developing uh, graben structure. So solutions coming down from the surface, leaching out the basement, coming back through the platform cover and uh, forming here these metasomatites and sulfide mineralizations in this uniform platform cover related to the rifting uh, process. No, this is a today Google Earth image, how it looks like. We have here this brownish zone indicating the fault, these uh, the line structures. We have indicated them here. Yeah. No. So the prospecting strategies here are, of course, remote sensing, looking for dark areas in the limestones, geological maps, air photo analysis, geochemistry, but then, of course, drilling. But we need to remember 
that secondary zinc minerals are soluble and we do not see them. They are gray and whitish and can be mixed up with gypsum, for instance, or some uh, soft silicate like uh, schists, shales. So the conclusion here is we need facts, of course, but we need a deep understanding of the process. And then we need an exploration model that can explain uh, these things, and this will guide us to the new uh, discoveries. So then, uh, oh, no, here's this one. Oh, here. So, and all this, of course, we need to fix in a map, in a prospectivity map, showing us where it could be, and then we can underline uh, the, these big fold structures uh, uh, showing us the prospectivity for, the, for this type of mineral occurrence and also express this in the, uh, in the principal metallogenic uh, uh, cross section. So now I'm done. Thank you very much for listening.